because something came along called the holographic principle. And um, this basically says you take a, a theory of, of gravity, so in this room, say, and, but you can describe that theory of gravity just as well by looking at a, a different theory that lives on the boundary. So, for example, if I take gravity in this room and then the boundary of the room is, is um, imagine it as being the wall of the room, just for you know, illustrative purposes, then, um, then I can think of this quantum theory that lives on the wall, but it can describe all the gravitational physics in the room, if you like. I mean, I'm really talking about space-times here and the boundary of a space-time, but just to, to picture it. That quantum theory on the wall is it doesn't lose any information. We know that. That's good, healthy theory. So that implies that the, the full gravity theory, that when you think about it in space-time, in the room, that shouldn't either. But we don't know how. Okay, so that's the puzzle. So it seems that information wasn't lost, isn't lost. Hawking conceded a bet as a result of this, with John Preskill. Hawking was claiming information would be lost, Preskill said it wouldn't. Um, Hawking conce has since conceded the bet, bet thanks to this holographic idea. But still people haven't understood how it really is, where the information, where is it still? Well, it seems, so, so I mean, it, this is not completely non-trivial trivial thing, and it all goes back to something that um, guys called Bondi, Metzner and Sachs did uh, back in the 60s. And what they were thinking about was they were thinking about the uh, how flat space how how a flat asymptotically flat space time what symmetries does it have? So uh, I don't know if you remember once we talked about uh, future null infinity. Do you remember this, Brady, back in the day? No, I don't know. It's all a blur. Time. Anyway, future null infinity is just a place where um, it's like the future for light rays. Okay, they were asking what was the symmetries around there. You know what things leave things unchanged, what can you do to leave things unchanged. Naively you might just think that it's, you know, you do sort of, you shift your coordinates by a constant amount, so you shift, you know, you say I'm, I'm here with position x and I shift it by a constant amount, and that leaves things unchanged. It turns out there's more to it than that, there's a, a lot more to it than that, and this is quite unexpected. And they, were, they were thinking about the effects of gravitational radiation and um, things like that, and they discovered that there was actually a much larger class of symmetries, um, called the BMS symmetries, and in particular they include something called super translations. And what these super translations are, so if you imagine uh, this, this surface, this, this future null infinity, it's a light-like surface, you have to be travelling at the speed of light to sit on it, and it's in the far future. Um, so imagine, say, the surface of the Earth is, a, is actually a light-like surface, it's not, but let's just imagine it for you know, then, um, and you have to be a photon to sit on it, okay? You have to travel at the speed of light. You could have define a set of coordinates which told you that you were on the surface of the, uh, of the Earth, this light-like surface. Like you're in Nottingham or something? Well, no, that you're actually, okay, you, yes, you could have something that says you're in Nottingham, but you could also say something that actually you're on the surface itself oh, okay, as well. So, so, so let's call that coordinate constant, so something that's constant on the surface. And you could imagine changing that coordinate by a constant amount, and you, it would still be constant on the surface of the Earth, because you've only moved it by a constant amount. So that's fine, that's, just, that's, that, that's not one of these things, that's not one of these uh, super translations. What a super translation would be is, is if the amount by which you move the coordinate depended on where you were on the Earth. So for example, if you're in Nottingham, you might move by a different amount compared to it, uh, if you were in London or if you are in New York. And the amount by which you move that that uh, coordinate changes. That's a super translation applied to actually a, a light-like surface rather than you know, in reality. So that's a super translation applied to, to you know, what we call a null surface, a surface on which you have to travel at speed of light to, to be on. Okay. So this, these things exist. These are part of the symmetries of, uh, of asymptotically flat space-time. And you can sort of, it can have an effect, right? So you can imagine like uh, the Earth with a, a bunch of satellites very, very far away, sort of in, in, in what we call an inertial orbit, but they're all just, you know, nicely, evenly distributed, orbiting very far away, but around the Earth. You can ask what happens if a gravitational wave goes past and then disappears. Well, what would happen is you have something called gravitational memory. Those satellites will move a little bit. And so that's the gravitational memory that, that the, the the wave might have gone, but it, it's moved the satellite. It's done. It's, it's left its mark. It's, it's left its mark. So, what does that impact does that have on um, on these super translations? Well, these super translations have a charge associated with them, and so the way you can differentiate, you could tell 
that this wave went past or didn't is because you would have a different charge associated with this super translation. It's a gravitational charge. Okay, so the, and there's an infinite amount of these things. Okay, now what Hawking realized was that these things also exist on a black hole event horizon.